But I'm delighted to be with you this evening uh, for many reasons, not only because of the conference um, and to be with some of my colleagues, but I get a chance finally to see some old friends I don't see often enough, like Anne and TN, and some more recent ones I see too little of as well, like Anoop and Chong En. So before beginning the, my remarks, however, I'm going to dispense with uh, my responsibility to add an air of levity at the beginning of the festivities and of the talk. We're mostly economists or uh, uh, budding economists here. So I'm going to tell uh, a joke that you may have heard. It's one of my large repertoire of economist jokes. But it's told about any three professions, and I tell it about medicine, e uh, engineering, and economics. Three people show up at the pearly gates waiting entrance to heaven. Anne's shaking her head. She's heard this one many times. I apologize. <laughs> Uh, and if I'm, if there's nothing new. And uh, unlike the current situation, uh, there's a temporary housing shortage. And uh, in light of the temporary housing shortage, they invoke an old rule of thumb that you get in an inverse order of the age of your profession. So the doctor stepped forward and said, Adam's rib, the creation of Eve and all that, obviously medicine's the oldest profession. And that seemed convincing until the engineer stepped forward and said, wait a second. Before you created Adam and Eve, you created the universe. That was an engineering feat. Obviously, engineering's older than medicine. And that seemed to really close the deal until the economist said, wait a second. What'd you create the universe out of? Chaos. Who do you think created all the chaos? <laughs> well, I think the causality's probably running the other way with the new governor of the RBI, but he's uh, not uh, avoiding any chaos. Um, it's particularly appropriate uh, as we're brought together this conference when we have academics and policy practitioners because our, our times are much more than academically interesting. Uh, the old aphorism is that the Asian wise man would ask the deity in his prayers to spare him from living in an interesting era and we have not been so spared whether we're academics or the new governor of the RBI. What I want to do tonight is something that hopefully will be both complementary to and consistent with much of the discussion today. Certainly it is, I think, with what I heard this morning. And that's to focus on much longer term issues. We're all keenly interested in the short run difficulties and medium term outlook challenges confronting Asian economies. Uh, from capital flight and rapidly depreciating currencies to slower growth. But I want to focus on the longer term. Not because these shorter term issues are unimportant. Indeed, obviously the longer term will eventually become the rolling, uh, the rolling out of the short run performances. And certainly behavior today, certainly in the private sector, but hopefully occasionally in policy circles, is heavily influenced by expectations of future performance and policy. But I want to ask the following question. If we were convened here, I guess this building literally wasn't here, you'll see in a second, a generation ago, in the building next door, a generation ago, what would we have been talking about? The US, indeed the G7, was experiencing a horrible sustained bout of inflation. In 1980, we had simultaneously 13% inflation and a horrible recession in the United States, which came to be called stagflation which spawned misery indexes and uh, uh, helped elect President Reagan. Something, by the way, stagflation, something we, uh, most of us should be concerned about down the road as well. Deng Xiaoping had just begun his opening of China to a socialist market economy. Rajiv Gandhi's reforms, then Finance Minister Singh playing a prominent role would not occur for at least an additional decade. And Indian growth, certainly compared to subsequently, was anemic. The Asian tigers, Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and Korea, were an important story, but a small one for the global economy. They were the subject of considerable analysis. But the bulk of Asia wasn't much on Americans' radar screen. Probably not also on most Europeans' radar screen. If I had given a talk at that time and predicted 
that two successive bouts of disinflation would be consistent with a great moderation long boom lasting a quarter century, that hundreds of millions of people would have been lifted out of abject poverty in the space of a generation in China, to a lesser extent in India and elsewhere in, uh, in Asia, that communism would collapse. I had the remarkable experience of being on a presidential mission to Poland shortly after the Berlin Wall fell. General Jaruzelski was still General Secretary of the Communist Party and President of Poland. And through an interpreter, he told us that the inevitable result of historical economic forces has led us to capitalism. <laughs> I was the only one in the room that had any appreciation for the remarkable nature of that statement. That developing market plus emerging market GDP at PPP today would be larger than the combined GDP of the advanced economies. That a developing economy, China, would become literally globally systemically important. I suspect most of you would have been mumbling under your breath, Boskin must be off his meds. But all those things happened in the space of, and others obviously, in the space of a generation. None of us has a crystal ball, but I want to spend a few moments about thinking about what are the big challenge to another successful multi -gener uh, gener uh, a generation, multi-decade run for Asian economies. So let's first just in, for one or two minutes repeat some facts that are well known for people here, but just to get some issues on the table. We've seen tremendous growth, obviously China averaging almost 10% for this almost quarter century. But Indian growth was substantial. Indonesia, Korea, Taiwan, all good. The United States averaging about 3%. Japan, 2%. Ger Germany under 2%. Australia doing well. Okay. So compounding that growth for quite some time has led to a remarkable increase in GDP per capita so that as we heard this morning in a Noop's presentation about those that have escaped the middle income trap into advanced economy status, into rich status or high income status, if you want to call it that. But still, per capita incomes are still quite modest in some of the successful developing economies like India and China. And while hundreds of millions of people are lifted ab out of abject poverty, more are still poor and remain poor. If we look at what's happened in population growth in these countries, there's been virtually none in Germany and Japan, literally. Virtually no growth in population since 1980. It's a remarkable fact. This is the first time that I'm aware of in human history that a population stopped growing for reasons other than war, famine, or disease. And some other countries are following in their footsteps, perhaps. Okay. Korea, Taiwan, the US all had modest growth. Obviously, Singapore, where migration, immigration is now a huge issue, has grown substantially. But Indian growth has been substantial. Double China's in this period, round numbers. If we look at old age dependency ratios, and it's not the only way there's some dependency. Children, young children are dependent. They have, need schools and other, are dependent on their families and the state in other ways. We take a look at this, and what do we see? Japan and Germany are over 30% right now. India, Indonesia, under 10%. China, 11%. The US, under 20%. What's the projection, um, medium term uh, population projections, net of immigration are probably easier to make than economic projections, but let's take a, whoops, let's take a look. Okay. So what is likely to happen? Germany, Japan, Hong Kong, tremendous increases in the ratio of retirees to workers. The U.S. is going from three and a quarter workers per retiree to two. Germany and Japan, and perhaps some other countries soon, one to one. For those of you who are big believer in private, believers in privatizing Social Security, 
It's a perfect place to do it. You just buddy up an old person and a young person. Look at China. China in a generation will be as old as the United States. Now these are occurring for different, for the same reasons and with different weights in different places. Lower fertility and not often remarked about enough, increasing life expectancy of the elderly. The life expectancy of Americans conditional on reaching age 65 has gone up a month a year for 40 years. It's like every year we live and we get a bonus month in expected value terms. Now over the span of a few quarters, over the span perhaps of the uh, time frame of an American president or a central bank governor in many places, maybe demography is not really important, but over the span of a generation when these things compound, it's immensely important. We look at what's happened with Asia, developing Asia, leaving Japan out of the story, and developing Asia is now 30%, or heading to 30%, projected in 2018 is now a quarter, of total global GDP. So a generation ago, an American, thinking about the American economy, didn't have to think much about Asia. There was this issue of competition from Japan and autos and a couple other sectors. Or maybe I should restate that. They should have been thinking more, not just about the future, because at the margin we were more open than on average. If we wanted to buy more oil, it was on world markets, sell more soybeans, it was on world markets. So at the margin we were 100% open. But a combination of factors meant that you can't much think, even, you can't even describe the American economy today without conditioning on what's going on in the rest of the world and increasingly what's going on in Asia. So with, those, with that kind of background in mind, let me just give you this economist's perspective. I started off telling Nick I'd talk about five big issues, and then I had, I'd lumped some together, so I disentangled them, and there are now seven, which is a little confusing for someone, for someone who tries to be very careful with numbers, so I, I unbundled several. And these are issues that I think uh, we all have to work hard on. They're issues that if Asia is going to be successful, and again, I speak generically of Asia, I'll talk a little bit about China and India and so on, uh, these things are selectively important in different countries with different weights, but I think I will just uh, uh, let you understand that I'm talking, um, that when I speak generically, I understand there are large differences among, among many Asian economies. So the first is, how much longer can low-cost surplus labor migrate to productive manufacturing, into the cities and productive manufacturing? Well, in China, which has benefited the most from this phenomenon, wages have started to rise. There's increased co low competition from other low-cost countries like Vietnam. There's a clamor for improved working conditions and higher wages. There's been a lot of excess built up for many reasons, some of it mirror imaging things in the financial sector, which I'm not going to spend much time talking about because I know Ron's on the, on the panel and he'll I'm sure uh, weigh in on this uh, later this evening. But there's been a tremendous push, industrial policy and social engineering push that's led to massive excess capacity in some industries, trying to generate employment. So how much longer tens of millions of Chinese and others are going to migrate into cities and find productive uh, employment and manufacturing? is a big issue. China's announced, is in the process, in the 12 five-year plan of trying to rebalance more to domestic demand. There's a demand as well as supply side of exports, you know. Um, what, what happens in the, what used to be called the West or the advanced economies, how well we grow will heavily reflect how much derived demand there will be for that labor to continue migrating into those cities. Not enough attention is being paid to those issues, in my, in my opinion. 
I think it undoubtedly has some time to go, but whether it has another generation, I would, I would find that surprising. Second issue, trade and growth. With and, uh, with and of the developing market economy, the uh, developed economies, and inter-Asia. Most Asian economies have large and growing internal economies, growing service sectors and the like. And the notion, of course, that somehow they had decoupled from the advanced economies was always radically overstated. I'll speak in a moment about human capital innovation as sources of growth, but a continued growth slowdown in the advanced economies, a new normal of slow growth weighed down by excessive debt, rising taxes to finance more generous transfer payments and social insurance systems, will be a serious impediment to Asian growth and require even greater rebalancing than is currently being anticipated, for example, in China. As was discussed this morning there are by Jonathan, for example, there are substantial opportunities for additional trade liberalization, for example, in investment and services. But given the explosion of bilateral and regional FTAs, there's also substantial opportunity to what might be called trade law rationalization. And most of all, the other Asian economies, almost all, not all of them, but almost all, have an immense stake in China's continued economic success. And while the Vietnamese are competing with the Chinese for some types of low-cost manufacturing and increasingly will do so, just as a long period of slow growth in the advanced economies will be very difficult for the Asian economies, an economically tumultuous China is going to be a big problem for much of the rest of Asia. I'll come back to talk about the geopolitics of that briefly in a moment. Uh, but an economically successful China, despite the state capitalism and a variety of other things, some of the protectionism, can indeed, uh, if that is gradually eroded, can work to the benefit of other Asian economies. Human capital innovation, let's revisit the sources of growth. It wasn't that long ago that my colleague, my Stanford colleague Larry Lau and Alwyn Young at uh, Boston University did these studies suggesting that somehow the miracle of the Asian tigers in Japan was pretty straightforward economics and not quite so miraculous. It was due to tremendous increases in inputs, very high saving and investment rates, improving education, and major reallocation of the labor force to more productive sectors, for example, from rural, low productivity rural agriculture, but just in general. Suggesting that technical change and increases in total factor productivity were a tiny part of the story, if any. Uh, and this had two really interesting ramifications at the time, which I remember well because they were quite sensational at the time. First, of course, Increasing labor force participation to a higher level or shifting people to labor force participation in productive sectors of the economy to a higher level. Greatly increasing the amount of secondary and tertiary education and a big increase in saving and investment rates as occurred, for example, in Japan and so these other countries as well and in China more recently where the saving and investment rates are enormous, far too high for economic sense. Those are things that can jumpstart growth, can be very beneficial, but are one-time things. You can't increase, you can't double the labor force participation rate if it's over 50 percent. You can't invest more than 100 percent of GDP, although China looked like it was going to try at one point. <laughs> And secondly, all these people who are clamoring, and I bear a lot of scars from a lot of bitter internal debates in Washington uh, on this, that the U.S. should emulate the Japanese model or the Korean model and we should be oligopolizing our industries and managing our trade and the government should be picking winners and losers deciding where everything was being, investment was being allocated. Um, that seemed not to have been so wise if it was just that they got a lot more 
by increasing inputs. Well, subsequently, work by Larry Lau and Jung Soo Park here at Stanford suggested that more recently, and, and, and one of Anoop's charts this morning had this correlation between R&D and TFP growth, that increases in intangible inputs, education and R&D in particular, meant that more recent, more recent Asian growth has had more of a component of increased uh, technical progress rather than just increased factor inputs. So what's next for Asia in this regard? First of all, the economics profession is in the midst of a tremendous debate about the future of innovation in the advanced economies. Bob Gordon presents convincing statistical evidence that the pace of technical change has slowed considerably in the advanced economies. The U.S., for example, which is generally considered the most advanced economy in, mo in many technologies. Declining by maybe a third in the last few decades from uh, the late 19th through most of the 20th century. Well, imagine a much slower growing advanced economies, the, technolo the technological frontier advancing more slowly that means we'll be getting richer more slowly, affecting our demand for goods and services from Asia. It also means the technology available to them, lower cost technology as they catch up or start interior to the frontier and move toward it in many places uh, because it's cheaper than in inventing it yourself, will be growing more slowly. So this is another issue that Asia is going to confront. As it, has to, uh, as it has to move up the value-added chain to some extent through education and internal innovation. And here I want to point out one interesting aspect on another side of the debate, which if it's correct, might also have create difficulties for Asian economies, at least for trade and for Asian economies growing trade in tradable goods. The other side of that debate in the economics profession on innovation and technical change, for example, Eric Van Olsen at uh, MIT, suggests we're, we're in the early stages of a new wave of innovation that will be just as fundamental as electricity and automobiles and that sort of stuff. Based in nanotechnology and robots and artificial intelligence. Now, I've spent a, l a large part of my life, fortunately for me and for Stanford, not all of it, in universities. And one of the great things about academic researchers is how optimistic they are about their research and about the potential social benefits of their research. Mm -hmm. And some fraction of that is obviously correct. Uh, research universities are tremendously important to the U.S. and global economy. But if we took the most optimistic thinking by these researchers, there will be a lot more stuff, a lot more activity performed through artificial intelligence that will disintermediate even more low-cost labor before many, many more tens of millions of people migrate out of uh, rural agriculture into the cities to try to produce whatever the uh, next generation of cell phone type products are, et cetera. So these are fundamental questions that nobody can have a good answer to at this stage. But they're things that are really, really important to long-run Asian growth. I might quickly, as an aside, say that uh, having been involved in these debates over the years about how much was factor input, how much was technical change, what were the sources of growth, my work with Lao on the G7 countries since World War II, we concluded that the data were most consistent. I apologize for the jargon for those of you not used to it. That uh, technical change had been capital and human capital augmenting, what we call generalized solo neutral technical progress, um, which again has somewhat different ramifications than the usual either neutral technical, Hicks neutral technical progress or Herod neutral, where it's just augmenting labor. It's as if, uh, to use an economics example, one Kenneth Arrow was going to be worth uh, seven 
low-cost workers, et cetera. That seems not to have been the case. So what we observe in, in our empirical work is data on output and data on inputs and factor prices to some extent. And we have to figure out what's going on with those inputs. And the tremendous debates in the economics profession about whether to adjust the quality of labor and assume some simple constant returns to scale with a um, improving labor, maybe also do that with capital, or whether we should view these as, um, as Lau and I did, as uh, part of the technical progress augmentation process. They have dramatically different implications, and there's no reason why it needs to be the same for developing <coughs> economies as for advanced economies. In fact, Lau and Alwyn Young found the opposite, that technical progress, Lau and I found, was the major reason for U.S. and G7 growth, but it was mostly factor input for the Asian economies. The next is demography, social insurance, and taxes. And here, uh, we've talked a bit about demography already. Many Asian economies, China and India, uh, prominent among them, have very nascent social insurance systems and um, tax systems which are less than modern, let's put it that way. But I want to remind you of the most one of the fundamental equations of public finance. The tax, and it's a and really hard to understand this. There's, uh, you have to be able to multiply and divide that the tax rate necessary soon or if you borrow now later when you pay taxes to pay the interest on the debt, necessary to pay for pay-as-you-go finance transfer social insurance systems is equal to the replacement rate, how generous the benefits are relative to the incomes being, that are paying the taxes, times the dependency ratio, the number of people receiving the benefits divided by the number of people paying the taxes. And so if you let the benefits get too generous or too many people collecting and not enough paying taxes, tax rates have to rise sooner or late. And eventually they become very, very large. A calculation I did, for example, for the United States suggests that if the Congressional Budget Office's uh, projections of the future rise in health care and social security costs came to, came to pass, and we financed that with just a proportional increase in payroll and income taxes, that the vast bulk of the middle class would be paying marginal tax rates of over 70 percent. They'd be minority, minor minority partners at the margin in their own labor. So all the advanced economies have been focused on this for some time. Uh, I've spent some time with the Chinese and others trying to get them to think about what will happen later as the demography turns against them and build that in early on. Um, but it will be very, very important for the rapidly aging societies of Asia, developing Asia, to get rich either before or at least simultaneously with getting old. Because while being old and rich will be difficult, being poor and old will be far more difficult. The next set of things, again, we're more than halfway there, I promise you, only a few more minutes. Energy and the environment. Many parts of Asia have strange energy systems. They import a lot. They um, kind of like the financial repression and deposit rates in China. They keep retail prices low uh, for gasoline uh, to try to let people afford gasoline and to prevent social unrest, but uh, there's no reason to economize because of that. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of uh, um, state intervention in energy markets. And while there are some people in Asia, the Kazakhs, for example, that have a lot of energy, um, the Chinese have a big import bill. India imports a lot of energy. The growing population and the desire for rapid growth suggests that there will be, even with substantial improvements in energy efficiency, the need for a lot more energy in the future. And while some of my green energy venture capital friends or my uh, friends in the engineering and earth sciences department think that we're going to uh, 
rapidly solve some of the technical and economic barriers to have widespread renewable energy available uh, on a commercially and without massive government subsidies on a commercial and environmentally reasonable, uh, important scale, uh, something I know a lot about, and it's going to take a long time for that to happen, let's put it that way. Uh, probably longer than the generation we're talking about before we're sizably reducing the use of oil and natural gas in the advanced economies. These other things will be niches. They'll grow a little bit, even with all the subsidies and regulation uh, and state pushing them, they'll grow some. But to give you a simple uh, way to think about that, if wind and solar each doubled and doubled and doubled again over this period, it would account for 3% of global energy. So we need to do better in diversifying our sources and dealing with our environment, but uh, we're going to need a lot more oil and gas, and a lot of people in Asia are going to need a lot more oil and gas. Uh, hydraulic fracking and horizontal drilling has generated uh, some great opportunities in the United States if the government doesn't kill it. It's happened mostly on private land, or some, by the way, reckless development by some private uh, companies that cause some hazards or uh, environmental problems. Uh, create a pall over it. Um, we have massive oil in Alberta, which will, if it doesn't go to the cleaner burning, uh, safer pipeline route to the U.S. Gulf Coast, will eventually go to China. And shipping is less reliable than pipelines, more of it will leak, and it will be burned less cleanly in China. Um, so, and now, one of the things I didn't mention was that Mexico, as a new president who wants to open up Pemex, at least to joint venture foreign investment, which would be quite a remarkable thing. So we have a tremendous change in the geopolitics and economics of energy and the reduction in the potential reduction of strategic influence of OPEC. But the Chinese and are running around the world trying to buy up resources because they're very nervous about where they're going to get energy from in the future. Uh, there is apparently a massive amount of energy in Asia, Asian Russia, Western Siberia, for example, and early days of really exploring what's there. But that's another set of issues that will come about, about the infrastructure for gas and energy from different parts of the world. But a big import bill. And finally, in addition to uh, the U.S. preoccupation with carbon emissions, which is a legitimate preoccupation, anybody who spent any time in China understands that local pollution is a tremendous problem in those, in those economies as well. And reducing uh, the growth of coal, slowing that down, and others subbing out coal with natural gas if, uh, for example, fracking can free up enough at commercially sensible and economically manageable terms. Uh, natural gas in China. There's a lot of it in China. No one knows whether how much of it will be extractable at uh, reasonable rates. But this is a big issue. And without a lot of energy, that growth isn't going to occur. And the U.S. and Europe are, uh, ha have more constituencies and more powerful political interest in slowing the growth of carbon emissions which would be a very great, di would, for which the Chinese would, are tr we're trying to put the Chinese and others uh, on the block, and they're going to resist that because they want to grow. So this will be a source of tension. It's also kind of a pretty obvious thing in economic development that eventually we substitute better and more variety stuff for just more stuff. And as we get richer, we demand greater quality and need less quantity. Uh, and that's starting to happen in Asia and will happen increasingly. Whether that's fewer children investing more per child, whether that's in the environment, whether that's in the quality and variety of goods that middle income, the growing middle class <laughs> in Asia wants to consume. These will all be very, very important. And it's unclear in some of these societies that the large reliance on domestic, um, on domestic, in some cases, state-owned enterprises is capable of providing that increased quality and variety 
without a change in the institutional arrangements. Finally, and perhaps most importantly, and related to all of these things and the framework for all of these things is institutional development. Development economists have uh, now, you can't go a day without a development economist telling you that it's institutions, not culture, that matters. And among those institutions, um, strong enforcement of property rights, stable, predictable, and non-confiscatory tax and regulatory regimes that they view as essential for long-run prosperity. In too much of Asia, including China, to some extent India, corruption and or state or crony capitalism, excessive power by government officials exacting payment or even more generally diverting resources is the, no is the near normal. In short, far too much activity winds up being devoted to what Ann Krieger taught us some time ago, is rent seeking rather than to producing goods and services. And if that doesn't change considerably, the nature of the growth in these countries will be uh, continually affected. The extremely rapid growth in the last 20 years or so in China has hidden some of the costs of that, for example. But as Growth inevitably slows, partly for some of these reasons I said, some of these high saving and investment rates will get a big run up and then will slow down. Um, uh, Chong In's graphs were showing the lower returns to investment recently, for example. Um, attention paid to more of the rule of law, what in the United States we attribute to John Adams as the rule of law, not of men. Um, Decreased use of industrial policy, reduced administrative discretion, and reducing the power of subsidies to and from state enterprises will be essential, necessary in varying degrees by country, to maximize long-run prosperity. It doesn't mean it's going to happen overnight. I was pleased to see the, my, on my recent visits to China, Lo Ji Wei say that at this year's China Development Forum, for example, that resources should be allocated by prices and markets, not by government officials. Let's hope that the Chinese continue to move in that direction. And the only time will tell, President Xi seems to be serious at least about getting a certain number of people on corruption charges. Um, he believes that the uh, legitimacy of the party and of uh, the next succession would be undermined unless he, we clam he clamps down on what he calls tigers and flies, higher ups and lower levels. There's a long history in China of successful antecedents to improved administration. I've recently written some suggestions in this regard. I'll share a few of them with you very briefly. First, um, because of the tremendous power that local government officials have and the tremendous um, ability to exact fees and bribes and side payments and cozy deals for uh, granting licenses and land and permits and so on, um, it would be wise to start having a larger fraction of the judiciary, judiciary appointed by, reporting to, and paid by the central government. And number one, and number two, rotated frequently. That was a successful formula apparently in Ming, China, where the emperor rotated officials to avoid them getting cozy with the local, uh, the local power brokers. I was one of the economists that advised Yu Rongji to reorganize the People's Bank of China more along Fed lines to decrease the power of local party officials in the local People's Bank, which would just loan money to any enterprise to hire more people regardless of the economics or of the, the business plan. Um, he made considerable progress in that regard, but it was partially undone because President Hu's power base had been the provinces. and. Uh, so it didn't fully succeed him, and there are many good policies that don't last in the political system. I've been involved with some that have eroded myself. Um, in Hong Kong, as recently as the 1970s, if your house was on fire, the fire department would demand, to be, to demand a bribe to, to pump the water. So an independent commission against corruption called ICAC was appointed to, uh, uh, to root out and prosecute corruption. And 
this was accompanied by what makes sense. Number one, an amnesty for all but the most egregious prior behavior with a fine for unexplainable wealth, financial disclosure, and increased pay for those officials so they had less incentive and need for um, to go ahead and take bribes. So there's some hope. There's been, uh, we've had some discussions with Leah and others on this, on this score. So hopefully some of this will percolate. It will take a long time, I can assure you, for China to have an independent judiciary. But while that's happening, some of these other things could move in the right direction. Okay. I'm sure all of you could make your own list of challenges and opportunities confronting Asian eco economic development. Perhaps it will differ uh, tremendously by sub-region or by country. Doubt doubtless it would include all or most of the categories I've discussed and many other items I failed to mention. I've thus far assiduously avoided with some very minor exceptions some of the riskier geopolitical issues that could cause tremendous problems in Asian economic development from North Korea to the tensions between Pakistan and India or even as remote as it now seems, China and Taiwan, uh, or China and Japan, uh, you know, to take a current example. Hopefully these will all be resolved, or perhaps the best we can hope for, they'll at least be reasonably managed. But returning to my opening theme, let's hope that if we, maybe for me and a few others of you, it's likely our successors convene in another IMF SCID conference a generation from now, and we look back on Asian economic development from 2013 to then, that hundreds of millions of additional Asians will have been found productive employment in modern sectors of the economy and been lifted out of abject poverty, that our liberal, regional, and global trading regime will have had far more successes than failures and enabled greater growth, that innovation in the advanced economies will not have slowed to a trickle, that many Asian economies will have been able to move up the value-added chain in part through increased R&D and domestic innovation and improved education and health capital. That beyond the tigers in Japan, other Asian economies will have grown rich before growing too old and escape the middle-income trap. That both the current capitalist democracies and many emerging and developing economies will have humane but target effective and efficient social insurance and transfer payment systems that keep replacement rates and dependency ratios from forcing tax rates to crushing levels. That we will solve many of our local and global environmental problems in cost-effective ways that more and more of the human population will be able to enjoy better working conditions in, in an improved environment and greater quality and variety of the goods and services they consume. And finally, that the political and economic institutions will have evolved with minimal social disruption, let alone war, enabling greater economic and political freedom to an ever-growing fraction of the Asian population. If much of that is even remotely achieved over the next generation, we'll be able to look back, even after the likely considerably lower growth is almost certain over this next generation, at another truly remarkable success story. So thank you. It's late, but I'd be happy to take questions. Or if anybody wants to add we'll something, take up to three questions, <laughs> or comments, or suggestions, or corrections, or elucidations, or elaborations. So, who's first? And well, I'm going to go. <coughs> I would have thought that you'd add or include in one of your categories something to the effect, and I don't know exactly how to phrase it, that. The desire for what I'll call populist goals. Did that overwhelm the need for efficiency along the way? I have in mind the market imperfections of labor markets in many of the countries you're talking about. Land markets certainly in several of the countries are important constraints. And the trouble with many of these things is that the attempt to dismantle them meets not only the resistance of those who quite clearly are going to lose something in the process, but also a lot of people who just sort of think that's not fair. And it seems to me that that kind of political support is very dangerous, not only for countries in the West, but they're rich enough to afford more of it. 
but for the poorer countries, you really can't. I, I totally agree. It's it's. It's my public finance background. It's subsumed under this T equals RR times D, times DR. It's, it's that's all subsumed. It's not just the tax system. It's it's all it's all that stuff. So you're right. Um, I take it as a friendly amendment, but I tried to keep it to a reasonable length of time. Land reform is particularly important in several places, and property and property rights in China are a big issue. There are thousands of people come to Beijing every year from the provinces seeking redress. Local government officials are hiring people in Beijing to arrest them. So uh, there's a, f a fair amount of the social unrest in China is over real estate deals that local government officials are being done with local developers that are taking people's land, and they're, they're saying they're not getting fair compensation and so on. So there's no doubt about that. Uh, it's also an issue in the West. Uh, a separate talk would be whether capitalist democracy is uh, asymptotically an oxymoron. Mm -hmm. So. But well, we're richer, and therefore it's not quite as easy. Yeah, Tian. you to go back to the days when you were in the that time when we were discussing growth, optimal growth, and all that jazz, and we used to go back to Frank Ramsey and his model. And if you remember, Frank Ramsey's model of a brisk point, which set the upper bound on the utility that each individual will achieve and will desire to achieve. Now, Bringing that back into the current context, what should be, should there be, should be required to do no more than six dollars in PPP terms of per capita income around the globe as a whole, so that you contain all the environmental and other problems that you are referring to, or should we assume that forever growth at the what whatever rate? But positive rate is the is what well okay Tian is asking um, back when he and I were graduate students uh, you know, before World War II <laughs> just, um, back when he and I were graduate students growth models which dealt with optimal growth and you know we had Roy Radner's turnpike theorems and we had uh, the Ramsey model etc there was something called a bliss point, which was sort of, uh, which in, in modern mathematical economics would be kind of satiation, kind of in a sense. Or De Bruyne would call it local non-satiation, which is necessary to have a decentralized price system. So the question is, do we keep growing and wind up globally, rather than having some upper asymptote to GDP per capita, perhaps in PPP terms? And will that put so much strain on the environment as to be incompatible, is what Tian is saying. So my answer to that is the tip, I, I have nothing other than the typical economist uh, response to that, which is we should price externalities at a legitimate and rigorously de defined deviation of marginal social costs from marginal private costs, not at some central planner's political ideology or some businessman suggesting that there is none. And, uh, and in that regard, and from there, we should just see how preferences play out. Okay. Now, it probably means that the marginal social cost uh, on the environment would be rising through time, though telling rule tells us it rises with the rate of interest. Um, carbon stays in the atmosphere for a long time. There are a lot of uncertainties about all this, despite what you hear from some of the proponents. Arctic sea ice has just made a tremendous comeback, for example. So people last year were talking about Arctic ice melting as the obvious clinching point about how much the Earth has warmed and how it's all due to carbon. I've had to back off a little bit. The fact of the matter is carbon, because it stays in the atmosphere for a long time, um, is a big issue, right? And the emissions are growing. China's now the largest emitter. Uh, they're adding a tremendous amount of coal all the time. Coal's a very cheap, abundant resource in the U.S. as in China, for example, although coal's being subbed out by cheap natural gas, fortunately, which is the main way the U.S. is contributing to slowing the growth of emissions. 
So we need to we need to do this. It's very hard to do it globally. I mean, the, we have this. We talk. Anne mentioned property rights. Who has the right to the air? The Chinese view. I think the Indian view as well. And correct me if I'm wrong. Is you guys put all this stuff up there? We haven't gotten rich yet. Why, why should we be bearing bearing the cost of this? Let us get as rich as you, and then we can talk about it being peri passu. You've already most of the carbon up there. You put up there. So uh, this becomes a big issue. But um, uh, so I think it is true that as people have gotten richer, they've generally desired to have fewer children and they've needed fewer children. Uh, originally, perhaps there was a, uh, the family is an incomplete annuities market, as Larry Kotlikoff would tell us. So we had large families to take care of us in old age if we made it that far. Um, so that will take some of the strain off as population growth slows. Um, but we need to have a, a sensible pricing of externalities. Um, on the, um, on the issue of what, how rapidly we can grow, um, I think that's a, that's a big issue. I think, I think expectations have been for a very long time that there would be subsizable gains in standards of living at the generation over generation or decade over decade level, if not over year over year, among the advanced economies, which is really a creature of the previous couple of centuries, really. And what the, the ramifications of the disappointment of people in the advanced economies, let alone the, the billions of people in the developing world that haven't made it yet, will be if it turns out that the new normal is very small increases in standards of living, if at all. Um, I think that would, that's going to cause a lot of social disruption. I think my experience is it's much easier to mitigate and round off the rough edges in society and mitigate a lot of problems in a growing economy than in a stagnant economy. I think that's true inside each economy and it's true among, among economies. Absolutely right. I uh, would put to Ian's uh, question a bit different. What if there's no high level equilibrium traffic? What if there's no high income equilibrium traffic? So we're, we're either onwards and upwards or we're down in the back to the low end level. It's a very worrisome issue. Now, um, I was going to say, Wing, you're the last uh, question, but we've got two. So you could be the second last question. I'd like for you to elaborate on something you just talked about. Specifically, I'd like to know how would one be able to generate an adequate supply of the new global public goods that are needed and how does one and I like to talk also about the politics of maintaining supply of existing global public goods. Let me explain the first question. Like you said, uh, we are reaching the danger point of CO2 faster now because the rise of a lot of new countries. So how can well, carbon, we, carbon emissions are rising. I think there's a debate about what... how can we make them what, take responsibility yeah. of it? Because the India's reply is, look at CO2 per person. Which yeah, is or, not, not very or take all the stuff up there, you put it all, you put it all up there. We didn't... And then on the second part, that as, 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 as the gra economic gravity shifts towards East Asia, East Asia can afford to supply more of existing global public goods, but that is also means a change in global leadership. So how are existing leaders going to adjust to that? Th those are tremendously important questions and are, I think are legitimate within the generational time frame, if not quarterly or annual time frame that some of, some of us have been talking about. So let me start with uh, public goods, yeah, of which there are many. Um, the geopolitical um, security, safety, and, and military dispute resolution mechanisms that range from multilateral institutions to regional agreements. NATO for a long time for the United States and Western Europe, for example, was the main, uh, the main bulwark against the risk of a Soviet tank invasion across the North German plain. 
At the end of World War II, a set of remarkable things happened that are not, were not really the norm at the end of a lot of other wars. Maybe we tried kind of at the end of World War I, sort of, but Keynes correctly anticipated the consequences of Versailles. Um, Wilson tried with the League of Nations, but it didn't get very far. But a remarkable group of people that were very foresightful set up a bunch of institutions, the IMF among them, and with the US and other, other countries leading, despite the Iron Curtain falling soon thereafter, um, we viewed it as our responsibility as the richest, most powerful country in the world to help organize, maintain, support, and lead those things, often with others, but not always with others, and often refusing to go along with others. For example, President Eisenhower refused to join the British and French when they invaded Suez. So, whether it was the, anyway, and then there was this tremendous help in rebuilding Germany and Japan. The notion was not to be completely vindictive. Perhaps that was the rebound from how badly Versailles had gone. But usually victorious nations historically raped and pillaged, but in any event uh, did the more modern analog of that. They, exit, they, you know, they, uh, they took land, they did other things. Um, so this is a remarkable, uh, a remarkable period. So it's possible that those things could occur. But more generally, it seems to me, the norm has been more Metternichian balance of power politics. We're seeing that play out right now in Syria with Putin. It's just, um, so um, I don't have a good answer, but our, the set of institutions we've developed has frayed and is not currently up to the task. Uh, the United Nations has tried to lead on um, global warming, for example, and got way out ahead of itself, both substantively and politically. And because of that, there's been a tremendous backlash against it to the point where half the American population mocks it. Um, you know, the fact is the Earth hasn't warmed in 15 years. None of those models, they all predict we would have warmed from all the increased carbon. I personally think that it's likely that we face risk and we ought to be dealing with it. But because it became a doctrine that you couldn't even raise those issues, when it didn't pan out, there was an overreaction. It, there was an overreaction. So we need, I think we need to develop new sets of institutions. I think the you know, they're, they're far from imperfect, but the G20 is a step up from the G7, in my opinion, for some issues. There are some things that can be managed by a small set of countries, others that require a broad multilateral coalition. Um, I think if there's going to be uh, a successor to Kyoto that has any chance of being sensible, you can't have 200 countries sitting down trying to negotiate it in a room. You know? And you can't have it imposed on 195 of them by five. So we need to figure out a mechanism to get buy-in. And we're not going to, in any time in the near future, have a transfer of tens of trillions of dollars from the advanced economies over time to the developing economies to deal with it. It's just that the population won't stand for it. So I think the best we can do in this case is kind of manage them. And I think that uh, most of the advanced economies ha are trying to deal with that. They've, the Europeans have backed off from some of their more aggressive goals. And I think we'll, we'll stumble along in that direction as we will with some of the, the thorny uh, military and geopolitical and uh, uh, yeah, tensions, whether that's Pakistan and India or that's uh, you know, China and Japan or North Korea. So that's the best I can do. I wish I was more optimistic that we would all. Five bucks since this G2 would do it. I think I think the U.S. and China would not be able to agree on a on a wide variety of issues 
that the rest of the world would think was reasonable because their interests are different. And global warming is a good example. The Chinese are going to do some things. It's in their, their plan. But their growth is, even at much lower levels, even at 7 percent, is going to be so great that it's going to be tremendous pressure in emissions. They're not going to reduce their emissions. They're going to get to more cleaner sources gradually and so on. And I must say that most countries, as they've gotten richer, have dealt with this. Uh, I'm old enough to remember um, the very first time I was in London, the buildings were all black. Mm -hmm. Manchester was worse. So yeah, I remember the year I visited Harvard as an assistant professor, you could, in the winter, you couldn't go into a market and get edible produce, fresh produce. Right. So, so it's remarkable how private initiatives solves a variety of these things, the just as you know, technological change, for example, in energy has tremendously changed the energy equation. Um, and I think that the subbing of, of cheap natural, economically affordable natural gas for coal is going to do a lot more than government uh, mandates. But we'll see. Karen. Thank you. Well, Michael, it's a brilliant speech. I'd like to challenge you to end on a slightly more optimistic note. So we've seen 60 years now Oh, it's pretty Madison. optimistic. This is the best 60 years in economic history. Yeah. Uh, very strong evidence on that. And let's look forward to the next kind of 30 years. It may be true, as you said, that the advanced countries, we come to some kind of plateau. The Japanese don't want to grow any more than they've grown. So, so for the Germans. But I want to look around this room. I think everybody who is a little older than this lady here, <laughs> is earning about 200000 a year or more. And the average American family earns about 50000 I mean, there's a lot of room for the average American. And when I go skydiving, I see some average Americans down in Virginia and out in Pennsylvania. They've got a lot of room to grow. That's average Americans to come up uh, to a close approximation of where Jonathan Freed is. I don't know if can get up to him. But let's leave aside the, the advanced countries. I mean, there's no reason why all these people in Africa, 800 million, and all the ones in Latin America, and all the ones outside of Japan and Asia, can't have a generation that has the same kind of, kind of growth, really dynamic growth, that the rest of us experienced in the last 60 years. I mean, so maybe there's a cap on us advanced folks because we're so lazy or whatever, but, but that leaves, a, you know, that leaves uh, 6 billion people who could really have a very optimistic generation ahead. Yeah, I thought I actually, uh, maybe I, I wasn't as clear. I thought that by saying these are all obstacles, but I was cautiously optimistic that many of them would on balance work in our favor. Mm -hmm. But I think it is extremely unlikely that we will see the same kinds of growth. Maybe Africa will have this kind of growth because they're starting from so far down and they've got so much reallocation that can be done and there's so little capital per worker and so on. But I think in, in China, for example, it just would be astounding if they could grow at 10% for another 30 years. That would just be, it, it's, it's almost inconceivable. So that doesn't mean that you can't get a lot more people a lot better off. It doesn't mean that people who are middle class Chinese a generation from now will look a lot more like middle class Americans in, my, in this generation relative to wherever, they're gonna, wherever we're going to be a little better, at least a little better off down the road. But um, so, so I, share that, I share that view. I mean, I, but the question is also um, the demand for those products. So if we shift a lot of Africans out of agriculture into light manufacturing, for example, to try to replicate what happened in China, okay, the demand's got to come from somewhere. Some of it, you know, maybe some of it's coming from the people in China getting richer, et cetera, but the demand's got to come from somewhere to have the derived demand for that. And the question is, at what point do, you know, what does that do in places like China if they're being outcompeted by other low-cost places? It's not just a question of cost. And if the innovation really is in artificial intelligence is disintermediating ever more physical labor. 
for more tests. I, I have no idea whether that's going to occur. My guess is it's in uh, the second generation or third, not the first generation from now. But so I think I view it as an optimistic case that there will be a lot more people lifted out of abject poverty that to use China as an example will grow at six and a half or seven percent for the next 30 years. I think that would be tremendous. It's just getting interesting. Yeah, he's yes, he is, but yeah, he's sitting at your table, and you can ask him your question while he eats dessert. Michael, okay. that was terrific. Well, thank you very much.